Thank you. Thank you very much for being here today. I apologize for my voice or lack thereof, and I promise you won't have to hear too much from me today. Uh, we have a very special program, and all of these living histories uh, take shape because of our robust oral history project. We have over 1,250 uh, personal recordings in our collection about the life, death, and legacy of President Kennedy and the history and culture of Dallas and the 1960s. If you have a story to share with us, uh, it's really easy to become part of this collection. Just go to our website, jfk.org, and if you live in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, you can come to the museum and we can record a videotaped interview for our collection. If you live outside of the Dallas-Fort Worth area, we can do a telephone interview, and you can be part of this tapestry of living history that we're creating at the museum. And every so often, one of these storytellers comes back to be part of our Living History series. And today is quite possibly our most colorful and revealing speaker yet. Uh, <laughs> Nancy Myers uh, was Tammy True at the Carousel Club in the 1960s, one of Jack Ruby's headliners. And she has a remarkable personal story to tell us today about burlesque in Dallas, the Dallas nightlife in the 1960s, and Jack Ruby himself. So please join me in welcoming Nancy Myers to share her story. Today. Well, Nancy, we're taking a look at you on stage at the Carousel. Uh, let's set the scene, though. Uh, you were in 1960, a single mother living in Fort Worth, and you decided to pursue a career as an exotic dancer. How did that get started? By accident. <laughs> uh, I was, uh, I had some friends that had a band, and they got a, um, job and the guy that owned the club wanted a strip tease dancer and I could dance and so they decided I'd make a good stripper and I'm like no I don't think so so they talked me into it my girlfriend made me a costume we didn't know about breakaway zippers so she put hooks and eyes all the way down it and I'm thinking oh gosh am I gonna be able to get out of this thing and uh so I got out there and I did, what? well, first of all, the guy that had the band, he had to come over and teach me how to do bumps and grinds. Because believe it or not, I was like, mm, mm, you know. And uh, so he had to show me how to do all that. So uh, then the guy that owned Skyliner Ballroom in Fort Worth, he had strip tease on weekends. Well, he was there and he saw me. So he approached me and told me that he would like for me to meet a girl that uh, worked for him. Then she had told him she would um, train somebody if they had potential. So um, I said, okay. And he had me come out to Skyliner and dance and she watched me and she liked me and we bonded and she was older. So she was kind of like my mama. And, um, I just kind of went from there, and uh, then Jack opened Carousel, and he was looking for girls to hire. So Sherry told him about me. He called me on the phone, and he uh, hired me over the phone. He had never seen me, met me, or anything. Now, where did the name Tammy True come from? Oh, uh, there was a uh, agent in Fort Worth, and. She said, you need to pick a name. Well, you know how you go through your life thinking, boy, I wish I had a different name. All of a sudden, I couldn't think of anything. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, Tammy. And she said, okay. And that movie was out, Tammy Tell Me True. I don't know whether y'all remember that movie or not. And uh, so she said, why don't you call yourself Tammy True? And I said, okay. So that's how I got to be Tammy True. <laughs> now, you told me that you had seen or you knew Ruby from the Vegas Club as a teenager. I yes. I used to go dancing there. He had a real good band, and it was a real popular place. And I used to go there, like, on Sundays. They'd have, like, jam sessions and stuff and um, to dance. That's all I wanted to do. I didn't drink or anything, so... Uh, yeah, I knew who he was. I think everybody in Dallas almost in the entertainment business knew who he was because he made his way around through town. So he hired you sight unseen, gave you a call, you came over, and you were involved in a lawsuit which got you some publicity. Yeah, I had the guy at the Skyliner, I had sued him for $150,000. 
And I didn't pay a lot of attention to that. Now, y'all have to remember, I, I was really green. And uh, it came out, it went UPI. So my picture, I had a, like a five by seven picture come out in the New York Mirror, which has gone out of business now. And um, so Jack found out about that. And he came running back there all excited. Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me? And I'm like, I don't know. Well, I'm making you my headliner. From now on, you're going to be my headliner. <laughs> okay. So that's how I got to be headliner. Give us a sense of what Dallas nightlife was like in the 60s. It was great. It was, there was a lot of neon. There were uh, two more strip clubs right there. There was the carousel uh, parking lot and uh, the Colony Club, and then through the parking lot right behind the uh, parking garage was the theater lounge. So it was, I mean, downtown was booming. We had all these wonderful restaurants downtown and a lot of nightlife, and all the hotels had uh, celebrity, big-name entertainers uh, performing, and uh, a lot of them would come to our club after they got through, so... And how did the carousel rate in terms of the colony or the theater lounge? Well, it was a nice club. And uh, we were about the same size as the colony club. And we were both upstairs. And the theater lounge was bigger. It was like an old theater they had turned into a uh, club. And um, I liked it a lot. It had a balcony and I could always do like one for the boys in the balcony. <laughs> <laughs> was was Jack competitive with the other club owners, Abe and Barney Weinstein? Oh, he thought everybody was trying to shut him down. Oh, yeah, he was paranoid about Abe and Barney. They were brothers, by the way. And uh, the guy that uh, was the agent, local agent back then, uh, Pappy Dolson, Jack didn't like him at all, so he wouldn't book any girls up from him because he thought that he was, you know, wouldn't give him good girls on account if he booked for Abe and Barney, and so he was, yeah, he was a funny guy. Now, at the carousel, you would do three 15-minute sessions? Well, to 15 minutes, yeah. Okay. Uh, and every girl sort of had a hook or a special component to their act. Tell us about your act. Well, I did uh, different acts. I did a Latin number and a red fringe, you know, dread, uh, just Latin dancing, and... Um, then I also did a Southern Belle with the big hat and the hoops and all that and an umbrella. And um, then I just did a regular old strip. <laughs> <laughs> and there were also comedians. There was live music. Oh, yeah, we had live music. I think my drummer's here somewhere. Yeah, Bill Where Willis, the you, drummer Bill? at the Carousel Club, is here today. Where are you, sweetheart? There. Yeah. Good to see you. He was my best bud back then. He and I were probably the only two sane people that were there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, buddy. Now, let's talk about Jack Ruby, of course. Uh, first, let's start with what kind of a boss was he? He was a great boss. As long as you did your show and you uh, did what you were supposed to be doing, there was no problem with him at all. But, you know, of course, when I'd go in to get money and um, get paid on Saturday, we'd go to the office and he'd give us a check and we'd endorse it and then he'd give us the cash. And every time I went in on Saturday, he'd say, how much money have you drawn this week? None. You sure you haven't drawn any money this week? No, Jack, I haven't drawn any money. And he couldn't figure that out because I'm a single mother with two kids and all these other people were borrowing money during the week off of him, and I wasn't. And so then he decided I, that I had money. So he started telling people, oh, she's got money. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I just managed my money better than the other, some of the others, I guess. But yeah. how, how would you describe his personality? Feisty. And he was kind of like what now they say is uh, ADHD. You know, uh, he was he was really a, a mover and a shaker. You know, he had a routine. He'd get up in the morning, 
uh, eat dry toast and hot tea with boiled water. And then he would, if the weather was good, he would put on his swim cap and his swim trunks and go jump in the pool. Now, I spent many mornings standing there looking over at, uh, the balcony down at the pool with my coffee laughing about it. But he thought the chlorine was making his hair fall out. <laughs> so, uh, but he, uh, then he got dressed and he got his dogs, got in the car, and he came downtown. He loved his dogs. Oh, he loved those dogs. He loved, uh, especially Sheba. They were like his children. I mean, they were just, oh, he cooked lamb chops for them. You know, he was, uh, yeah, he loved those. Uh, and he was really good to all of us. He was protective of you, wasn't Very he? Very protective. And especially uh, the girls that were single moms that had children. He was so, he was really good to us. One of the girls got sick and went to the hospital. And um, he went every day to see her, sometimes twice a day. He went to the babysitter every day to see about those kids and make sure they had what they needed. So he was, uh, he was caring and he, he liked underdogs, you know. He would take up for anybody that he thought was being bullied or pushed around. Or, and he was also politically correct way before everybody else was. He'd tell his comedians when they came in, now, I don't want anybody in my audience to be upset, so no uh, uh, religious jokes, no ethnic jokes. Well, that made it damn hard for a comedian back then, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Jack was Jewish, of course. Was he, he was sensitive Jew to that? very sensitive to that, yeah. He grew up in Chicago back, you know, when uh, it was really hard on Jewish people. And uh, he grew up pretty much on the streets. So, uh, yeah, he was very sensitive about his religion. So that made him really sensitive about everybody else's. I mean, he, he was adamant mm -hmm. that, um, you know, he didn't want anybody saying anything that would upset somebody. We're going to talk more about Ruby in a second, but let's take a glimpse inside the Carousel Club. We're going to see a couple of dancers on stage. Not, not Tammy, unfortunately. We're going to see Diana the I'm Huntress. I'm going to do that live here. Oh. <laughs> <coughs> That's a surprise. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at this clip, and we'll talk about it. And here's a picture of you inside the club. Yeah, sitting by that cigarette machine. Right. Give us a sense of what the club looked like on the inside. Uh, well, let's see. It had red curtains, and it had that horse thing uh, on the wall behind uh, the curtains. And uh, when you walked in, the bar was over here, and there were three runways. A small stage, not a hell of a lot bigger than this one, and then three runways that went out into the audience. So people sat along the runways, and then we had tables, chairs, and I think we had a couple of booths back in the corner. The dressing room was right there by that cigarette machine. That way, you went right into the dressing room. And um, then the band was over on the other side of the cigarette machine. Now, we were talking earlier about Ruby being a, a very generous employer. He was concerned about where you were living at one time. Tell us that story. Well, I decided to rent a little apartment, efficiency apartment, so I didn't have to drive back and forth to Fort Worth every night. And one of the girls that I worked with, she and her husband lived in this small complex. And they had efficiencies. And they had one available right next door to them, so I rented it. And one day, he came, uh, Jack came there to the apartments uh, for something, to talk to me or her one, I don't know, about something. And we were at the pool. And uh, 
he sat out and he was talking, and but he kept looking, watching the people in the pool. Well, this was a gay community. And, you know, they were being silly, <laughs> you know, doing all that. So it's pretty obvious. And he kept looking at them, and he didn't say anything. And he left. And then that night, he called me to the office. And he said, Tammy, I don't like you living there. And I'm like, why? Oh, I just don't think you ought to be living there. I don't, I don't think you're safe. I said, well, why not? Well, there are a lot of gay people living there. And I said, yeah. I said, I'm probably safer there than I would be anywhere. <laughs> but he insisted that I not stay there. And uh, he was moving into some new apartments, brand new apartments, right there at the freeway and, um, uh, and Oak Cliff South, you know. And um, he insisted that I move over there. He even put down the deposit and paid the first month's rent so he could keep an eye on me. His apartment was right here, and then right here around that little corner was my apartment so he could watch me. Your story is fascinating because, of course, there are a number of researchers that believe Ruby was gay. No. No, he wasn't gay, trust me. He liked girls. <laughs> He, lo he loved women. He really did. He, was, uh, he had a girlfriend, you know, for years and years and years that nobody ever met or anything because she never came to the club or any of that. But uh, he had a lady friend. And, you know, I, he messed with the girls a little bit. So, not me because I was dating his best friend and he couldn't get away with that. <laughs> that also gave me an upper hand, too, to keep him under control. Yeah. Let's take a look at an ad for the carousel. You'll notice in the lower left-hand corner, it says November 1963. Uh, so this is from a, a Welcome to Dallas booklet that we have in our collection. And as you can see, it's a two-page spread here. Uh, some of the girls are featured. Tammy gets her own page there on the right-hand side. I, I love this picture of you because the electrical socket is so prominent. <laughs> where you're well, now let me tell you. Let me tell you about this picture. That picture right there was taken the night I did my first strip tease. So that is kind of my original first publicity picture. Really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Somebody took that back in where I was uh, changing clothes. See that mink stole? Mm -hmm. I was so proud of that. <laughs> and so I, I used it for my strip tease. Now, one of the uh, exotics featured on this page is Jada. And oh, yeah. Jack got Jada in New Orleans. Tell us about Jada. Okay, Jack went to New Orleans, and he came back. He went down there to get girls. I know they said he went down there to conspire, but he, you know, he went down there to find new girls. And um, he came back, and he said, oh, oh, I've heard this girl. Said, oh, she is. She's got beautiful costumes, and she's a... Uh, uh, she, you know, she's uh, got a lot of class, and oh, you know, she's really terrific. So I said, well, good. So she came in, uh, I think, the next week. She showed up in a gold Cadillac, you know, and uh, so uh, she got, came in, and I, so I did my show. She was going to be the headliner, which was okay with me, and... Um, so I did my show, and I got dressed real quick to go out in the club. Well, he ran the spotlight uh, from a pole at the back of the audience there. And so I went out, and I'm standing beside him. And uh, she comes out and does her show. She was really pretty and had red hair and beautiful costumes, and she was flamboyant. And she was dancing, and all of a sudden... Uh, she reached down and got her G-string and pulled it over and back. And Jack started sputtering. <laughs> and that was a no-no. You know, they would have shut him down for that if there had been a vice officer in there. And, uh, but she's from New Orleans, so. Anyway, I looked at him, and, I, and he, was, he turned the uh, spotlight off. And then he turned it back on, and I said, yeah, Jack, you're right. She's got a lot of class. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, let's hear from Jada for a moment. Uh, Jada was uh, among those who gave interviews about Ruby after the shooting of Lee Harvey Oswald. So we're going to take a quick look at this clip, and then I'll ask you if her description of Jack and the club is accurate. What sort of people hung around the carousel? Do you mean the patrons or the employees or Jack's patrons friends? Patrons and Jack's friends, especially. <laughs> uh, Jack, uh, his friends were somewhat of the um, mm, colorful side from Chicago. I remember one in particular that uh, uh, <laughs> was up there one time, very hoodlumish type. But Jack mingled with a lot of people. He was very pushy. He would, you know, work his way into knowing a lot of people. He knew quite a great number of people here in Dallas. Everybody knew about him and knew who he was. You'd mention the name, they'd say, oh, yes, Jack Ruby. But uh, the customers up there were very nice. But they would frequently, they've said to me, how can you let a man like that holler, you know, at you? But uh, Jack basically was a very a uh, nice person, except that he liked to uh, be the center of attention a little bit, and he would get carried away with things and uh, just go off completely erratic. He would um, just get out of hand. Is that pretty accurate? Pretty accurate. All right. Now, she mentions hoodlum types. Now, of course, you knew you were going to be asked this question. Do you think Jack was in any way involved with organized crime? No. Not at all. He was, um, he had this uh, image that he kind of, you know, wanted to, people to think about him. And um, he would just meet somebody and tell them, come on up, I'll, you know, to the club and I'll, you know, buy you a drink or what. And they'd come up and, you know, he would tell me, oh, that's a friend of mine from Chicago. Everybody, you know, that he took under his wing was a friend from Chicago. So one night, you know, one of them was really good looking, so I was sitting at the bar talking to him. And um, I said, well, how do you know Jack from Chicago? And he looked, he said, I don't know him. He said, I never met him before. He just approached me on the street and told me to go on him. <laughs> But he didn't want anybody to know how soft-hearted he was. And he was just, uh, he was a goose. Or a sob story. You know, you remember that guy, that uh, carnival guy that somebody wrote about he beat up in the club? And Well, there was a guy that Jack got some twist boards, and he thought they were going to be a big seller. And they were ball bearing and had a thing, you know, that did like that. And he thought, oh, that's great for exercise. He demonstrated them on stage at the club. Well, he rented a space at the fair. And he had somebody demonstrating them out at the fair. And he met this carny guy. Well, the fair was leaving. The guy had nowhere to go. He didn't have any money. So Jack said, okay, you come and you can uh, do things for me at the club, clean up, and, uh, and I'll let you stay there. And he did. But then Jack caught him stealing something. And he threw him up against the wall and jumped on him. Well, they made a big deal out of that, but he didn't do it without cause. So anytime he did anything like that, he had been provoked. And she was right. He was kind of, you know, just kind of all of a sudden, just boom. So. Uh, well, that brings us up to the weekend of November 22nd. Here we're looking at the close sign at the carousel the night of the assassination. Now, you, you closed out the, the Saturday before. Mm -hmm. That was the last time you saw Jack, right? Yeah, I was on my way to uh, Oklahoma City. Where were you uh, when you learned of the assassination? I was in Dallas. I had just gone under the bridge earlier, coming from Fort Worth, and I was at a friend's apartment over at um, uh, Grand and... Uh, Anyway, I was over there, you know, uh, East Dallas. And the phone rang, and he went, uh, answered the phone, and he came back, he's standing there, and he said, the president's been shot. And I started laughing. I said, that's not possible. He said, no, I'm serious. So that's how I found out. Then I got in my car. I went to Parkland Hospital, and I was in the crowd, and everybody was like, um, 
they were dumbfounded, you know, like in stupors. Like, how could this happen? And a lot of people crying. And then they came out and said that he, he was dead. You were a Kennedy supporter. Oh, I loved him. Not, not many people know I was a good Catholic girl. And I was real happy when my Catholic president got elected. <laughs> and my grandmother really was crazy about him. She cried for days. She was so upset. Did Ruby ever talk about Kennedy? Mm -mm. But he had a lot of respect for anybody that he thought had made it. So it wouldn't, didn't matter. I never heard him even talk about politics. But he was, uh, that's the kind of guy he was, that he, because he was the president, then he, Oswald shouldn't have done him, done that. That is disrespectful, and that's exactly why that closed sign is on that door. He closed the club immediately, and he was really upset that the uh, Colony and Theater Lounge and all those other places downtown didn't close too. They thought it, he thought it was disrespectful. Sunday morning, you're watching TV, mm -hmm. and you see your boss, your friend. Shoot Lee Harvey Oswald. Mm -hmm. What's going through your mind? Well, the first thing that went through my mind was, that's Jack. And then I called. You know, I was, I don't know how to describe the feeling. Uh, I was shocked that he did that, but I wasn't really surprised. Because knowing him as well as I did, uh, and for as long as I did, I could see him doing that. If anybody was going to shoot Oswald, I could see Jack doing that. And the police were letting him in and out and roam around in the, you know, I mean, he was like, he could go in there anytime he wanted to. So they don't, didn't pay any attention. They let him in. I blame them for a lot of it. I think they should have um, not to, tried to grandstand and parade Oswald around so much with, you know, reporters and people standing around, and I just, uh, yeah. Were there often uniformed officers at the carousel? Oh, yeah, we had, they'd come in and get free coffee and stand around, and yeah, because he I invited them. Jack right. was, that's why the police let him just come and go, because he was a, a great friend of the police department, and he followed all the laws, you know, and he was... Uh, now, a couple of the uh, dancers went on television. We saw Jada's interview a moment ago, but you, you chose not to. No. Why was that? I had two babies, and uh, I, didn't want the, uh, I didn't want that kind of publicity. I didn't want to be involved, and uh, so I just kind of tried to drop under the radar. I didn't give any interviews. Uh, didn't, of course, the FBI followed me around for three or four years, any city I showed up in to work, they were calling, wanting to make an appointment to come talk to me. And, uh, but I just, uh, I was worried about my kids. And nobody back then, no one knew what in my neighborhood, I had bought a house. That was another reason Jack thought I had money. Uh, <laughs> but I had bought a house and, um, my two children lived there, and my mother and my grandmother also lived with me. And um, so uh, I didn't, my neighbors didn't know who I was. I, you know, I mean, I participated in uh, PTA at school, and I'd bake cookies, and, you know, we did carnivals, and, you know, uh, like just a regular mom. And um, then when it came out in the paper, well, hell, everybody knew that I was taking my clothes off. So Jack's murder of Oswald directly affected you in that way? It did. I want to share with you some rare footage, and I don't think even you had seen this prior to today, but this is the Carousel Club sign coming down uh, at the club, and you'll see it's replaced by uh, another uh, similar burlesque club sign. So you never danced again at the Carousel, but you continued... Uh, the, your burlesque career for another oh, several I years. Oh, I did, yeah. And after a couple, uh, let's see, and I think around 1965, uh, I got a call from uh, Barney at the Theater Lounge. I was in Omaha, Nebraska. Most of the time I was out on the road back then, you know, after Jack. And uh, 
Barney called and asked me if I would come and co-star for um, Tempest Storm. She was coming in for two weeks, and he wanted to know if I don't. I there was a comedian working there for him at the time that I had worked to, uh, with prior to, so he hired me over the phone too, and um, I told him sure. So once I did that, went in there, that was my home base, so I could stay around uh, town more with the kids. I want to allow plenty of time for questions, so if you have questions for Nancy Myers, if you'll pass those to the end of your rows, we'll collect those and go through as many as we can today. So, so Nancy, here we are after the 50th anniversary of the assassination. What are your thoughts today about Ruby and any possible connection Ruby may have had to the assassination? Well, to start with, I don't think he had any connection. To it. He didn't know that that was going to happen. If he had known that, he would have told somebody. Um, and I miss him a lot. I mean, I really, I liked him. And he was a good friend to me. But, uh, no, I don't think he had anything to do with the assassination at all. Did you follow the trial in 1964? Not really. I just uh, kind of, you know, I always felt bad that I didn't go see him when he was in jail. I, that really made me feel lousy. But there again... You know, and I didn't want to show up at the jail with ph photographers and, you know, all that publicity crap. So um, I did get to go to his grave, though. And Just that, recently? Mm-hmm. Yeah, about a year ago. Did we go a year ago? Or Yeah. Last year, 2013, was a big year for you. Yeah, uh, you had a book come out with David Hopkins, and David is here today, right there. We're glad David could be with us. And you also were part of a, a docudrama called True Tales. So after 50 years, you did an oral history with us about five or six years ago, but after 50 years, why did you decide 2013 was going to be the year of Tammy True? I really didn't decide that. That young man, he started it. He came out and wanted to know what downtown Dallas was like in the 60s. He was doing an article for D Magazine. And... Um, I said, oh, yeah, I'll help you because I've got, uh, I've got a big box of memorabilia, uh, you know, all kinds of things from back then. And I said, you're welcome to go through it, you know, to give you an idea. So he came out, and we talked, and he left. And then he called and said, I need to come back because the editor thinks that you're more interesting than just the 60s downtown Dallas. <laughs> so he came back, and we... Uh, we uh, he wrote this wonderful article in D Magazine, and um, then from there I got the Ruby Review calling me. There's Miss Ginger right there. Now explain what the Ruby Review is. Oh, that's my girls, my young girls that are actually doing real burlesque. So all you young people that don't know about burlesque and just know about titty bars, <laughs> you can go see them. They're beautiful. They come out beautiful gowns, and they dance, and it's you need to go see them. And where do we go see them? We go see them at the uh, House of Blues. Usually, what, the last weekend of the month, y'all are there? But they've got a website, Ruby Review. And uh, sometimes I even go, and I even get up there and dance. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody just claps and carries on, and I'm like... Hell, they must love to see bag and sag. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe they just can't believe an old broad like me to get up there and show anything. <laughs> but um, well, the, I, told, uh, I told my girls, I said, girls, this is what you got to look forward to in 50 years. Don't go home and slit your wrist. <laughs> Well, we have the, the DVD of True Tales, and also we, we had your book, but I, I understand sold we have out. sold out of, of Nancy's book. Uh, but we do have the DVD still available. And after the program today, uh, and Nancy... And the DVD is wonderful, by the way. It's, uh, it was made by a professional studio, and um, I'm really proud of it. As you should be. It's a good, it's a good documentary. <coughs> and so uh, after the program today, David and Nancy will be at the table in the far back uh, signing copies of the book, and You're Nancy also. Sign, um, okay. 
<laughs> well, let's go through some of these questions because we have a big yeah, stack of questions lot. here. Um, I knew this one was going to come up. Did you ever see Lee Harvey Oswald at the Carousel Club? No. I, of course, I wasn't looking for him either. <laughs> but we had so many people in there. I can't, and with the personality that he had, I can't imagine him hanging around there. So. All right. Another one we got here is, what did your neighbors, if they didn't know you were a, a stripper, what did your neighbors think you did? I don't know. They just knew I worked at night. I guess they thought I was a waitress or something. I don't know. Were you ever, I didn't leave for work until around 6.30, 7 o'clock at night. Were you ever contacted or questioned by the FBI or the Secret Service or the Dallas police? Not the Dallas police, but I was certainly questioned by the FBI. Tell Ever us about that. Well, everywhere I went, you know, I'd book into a club, Des Moines or, you know, uh, Nashville or somewhere to work, and they'd be calling, wanting to come out and talk to me. And then I was also subpoenaed, you know, by the Warren Commission. And I had to, they flew me in from Oklahoma City to take my deposition, and then I had to turn around and fly back. So I wasn't in a good mood to start with. I had worked the night before, late. And I had to get up and take an early morning flight. So I read my uh, Warren Commission uh, report thing. And I think the first thing I said was, I'm not saying one thing, bad thing, about that man. So and I was kind of hostile through the whole thing. I, and I refused to sign it. When they uh, uh, called me back, I was in Lubbock working. And they wanted me to come to the federal building. They wanted me to sign off on my deposition. And I started reading it, and it was crap. And I said, no, I'm not signing that. Mm. So they scrambled around, called somebody, and finally came back and said, well, okay, you don't have to sign it. So. We have several questions about just the day-to-day -day operations at the club. Uh, was alcohol and food served at the carousel? No, just frozen pizza. <laughs> <laughs> In the microwave or something, I don't, toaster oven probably back then. Whatever happened to Jack's dogs? I, I don't, I'm not sure, but I understand that Andrew took them. Uh, he was, he worked for Jack, a uh, young black man. Andy Armstrong. Yeah. Uh, somebody told me that he took them. Okay. That's all I know. But I know he didn't go down there to kill Oswald with that dog in the car. I can tell you that, he would never have done that. How many dancers worked for Ruby at any given time, and who was your favorite? Well, it was usually four at a time, different, you know, some would come and go, and um, I, I don't know, I had a couple of really good friends, Joy Dale and I were good friends, and uh, uh, Gail Raven and I were very good friends, as a matter of fact, when all this started happening, she uh, she got in touch with me, and um, she lives down around uh, San Antonio, I think. But um, I don't know. I was friends with everybody pretty much. I'm easy to get along with, and I wasn't. You know, just because Jack said you're a star, I didn't. That didn't mean I believed it. You know, I mean, some of those girls, somebody told them they were a star, and they believed it, and they were like, no. So I had some unfavorites. <laughs> <laughs> but most of the girls that I worked with, I got along with fine. Was Ruby involved in drugs or prostitution? No. No, 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 no. That was a no-no. We, If he... He tell, told us when we went to work, he didn't want no drugs, he didn't want prostituting, he didn't want us, uh, you know, uh, uh, hitting on the uh, guy, the customers, you know, for, you know. That didn't mean we didn't get hit on. Got hit on plenty, plenty <laughs> by the customer. I had to, uh, I'll never mind where you question, I was going to tell you something else, but I'm, <laughs> we're, we're limited on time, folks. If, you, if you've got a story, you go right ahead. So I was working in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, for instance, and this guy was sitting at the bar, and I went there to get a, a Coke or something, and he said, uh, he said, I'll give you $200 if you'll come up to my room when you get off. And I said, no, thank you. I don't believe so. Well, I'll give you 300 I No, I'm not going to do that. 
well, everybody's got a price. What's your price? And I just looked at him and I said, if I want to be a whore, I'd be a whore in Fort Worth, Texas. I don't have to come to Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> End of conversation. <laughs> We're going to do two more questions. Uh, several people asked this. Uh, did you know Beverly Oliver? Yes, I do know Beverly Oliver. Is that the question? That was the question. I do know Beverly Oliver. Anything more you want to say about that? Mm, no, I don't think so. Okay. All right, and our last question today, which I think is a really good one. If you could tell people one thing about Jack Ruby, what's the most important thing you want to communicate? Well, I think I've already said, you know, he was, uh, everybody, you know, he had this persona of tough guy, but he wasn't. He was, um, he was soft-hearted and considerate and respectful, and um, he wasn't this bad guy. That's one reason why I've done all this, because I want people to know that he was not a monster and was he crazy? Maybe a little, you know, I mean, he was, but uh, he was a super guy. And he did what every, a lot of people in Dallas wanted to do, was get to Oswald. And he happened to have an uh, opportunity and had his gun because he always carried a lot of money with him. And uh, boom. All right. Well, Nancy and David are going to be signing books and DVDs there at the back. Please join me in thanking Nancy Myers for being our guest today.